Hello, everybody, and welcome to this month's Google Hangout. I am Veena Khanke, Director of Grants and Partnerships at Dining for Women. I have two guests with me today. I have Amy, who is the Data Associate at Dining for Women. Hi, Amy. Hi, Veena. And I have Ariane Kirtley, who is joining us from Central France. Hello, Ariane. Hello, Veena. Uh, Ariane Kirtley is the founder and the executive director of Aman Iman, also known as Standing for What It Is Life. And Ariane is going to discuss this project for Dining for Women with us. So Ariane, please go ahead and tell us more about your project. So thank you so much for having us uh, here today. We are very proud to be partnering with Dining for Women for the women of Tanga Washan. So Tanga Washan is a small village in something called, an area called the Aswag Valley of Niger, a valley in central Niger in West Africa. Before I go into talking more about the women of Tangawashan and our program called the HERDS program, HERDS for Economic Resiliency with the women of Tangawashan and Dining for Women, I want to tell you about the mission of Aman Iman. Aman Iman was founded in 2006 to bring resiliency, build resiliency among Africa's most vulnerable indigenous populations, starting with the Azawak populations of Niger. We also work with students across the world to raise awareness and to help these indig indigenous populations through our Wells of Love program. So the Azawak Valley, including Tangawashan, which is in the Azawak Valley, is 80,000 square miles and there are 500,000 people, half a million people living in extremely dire circumstances. First of all, who are the people of the Azawak? The people of the Azawak are people that were traditionally nomadic. They traditionally lived uh, with their animals, 300 heads of animal and in tents. And over the past 10, 15 years have become, set, become more and more sedentary and moved into villages. But why are they so poor? What is the problem? Well. In the past 15 years, there's been a huge climate change. Uh, it used to be the wealthiest part of West Africa, and today it's one of the poorest parts of West Africa, and it's all because of rain. It used to rain five to six months a year, uh, five to six months a year. And in the past 15 years, it's gone to five to six months to three months in 2006 when Amani Man was started to one month today. And so, whereas people used to live thanks to marsh water, and the herds used to live through mar marsh water, the marshes have dwindled to nothing. Here you have children digging in the marsh, and people also depend on very, very deep wells that never access water or hardly access water, 200, 300 feet, because water, accessible water, is 600 feet deep, too difficult to access with by hand digging, and they don't have the means to purchase the machinery. So in 2006, when I traveled to the Azawak for the first time, as a Fulbright scholar, I discovered this water situation and founded Aman Iman uh, to help address the water situation and uh, bit by bit address more and more other uh, of the issues that the populations deal with. And I'm bringing up this slide because we are very interested in the sustainable development goals. Uh, and we wanna just bring up that through Aman Iman over the past 10 years, we've been able to bring sustainable water to over 100,000 people. We've worked on the first six of these goals, the no poverty, hunger, health and well-being, quality education, gender equality, and clean water and sanitation. Because with our water, this is a borehole, we bring clean water, we bring water year round, we've been able to bring food, we've been able to do gardening and reforestation, bring skills training to women, build boutiques, improve the economy of the populations. We've been able to improve the health of the populations through hygiene and sanitation, uh, malaria prevention, nutrition, and other things, and other issues. And we've been able to help rebuild the herds of the populations. As I mentioned, herds were the trad traditional means of economic uh, survival. And so we've been able to help build herds among the women of the Azawak. Uh, herds are not only important for, they work as a traditional bank account, they are the means by which women can 
uh, buy clothes, food, improve their shelter. But they also improve the nutrition drastically of children through the milk, milk and milk derivatives, but also they provide a means to have meat if necessary in dire times of food insecurity. Here are some pictures of women in Tangawashan. So Tangawashan is a village of 2,100 people. Um, and they are, Tangawashan is particularly remote. And <clears throat> the women of Tangawashan have not only suffered from extreme poverty, but because of this poverty over the past 15 years, um, th they are traditionally matriarchal. And so the women used to be very powerful uh, and have access to a lot of resources. And But over the past 15 years, men have had to migrate out because of the loss of their livestock and have gone to Nigeria, have gone to Libya, where extreme Islamism has influenced their behavior, their mode of thought, and they've come back and started cloistering their women and really limiting women's access to resources. And then yet at the same time, women are responsible for taking care of their children. Their men are not here most of the year. And sometimes they have no means at all to take care of their children and their families. And so Aman Iman has worked with these women to have water, access to food, access to skills, but also we've worked with the men so that they allow the women to have access to resources work and have access to goats, for instance. So here's some of our projects, water, food security, education, gardening. But And so now we are working with the women of Tangaweshan, with Dining for Women, to grow their herds. That This is what the women of Tangaweshan have asked for. They want, this is their traditional means of survival and well-being. Um, and so initially, 60 women are going to benefit from our herds program. 10 women will receive one cow and 50 men, women will receive two goats. Um, and also 45 women that belong to the women's cooperative that was also started by Aman Iman are going to benefit from proper animal husbandry training with the help of our communities that have all, already benefited from our herds program. Eventually, all the women of Tangawashan will benefit from this project because the goats and the cows are alone. And after year and after giving birth uh, to cows, uh, to calves and kids, they will be handed over to new women. And it will be with the children of the initial mothers that the herds will start to grow. The methodolo methodology, we will se select our beneficiaries, our most vulnerable women of Tangaweshan will be selected with the help of the women's cooperative. We will establish a fodder bank to help provide food at low cost <clears throat> to the women beneficiaries. The fodder bank will also be run by the women's cooperative, by a management committee selected by the women's cooperative. We will be training in proper animal husbandry. The livestock will be purchased with the help of the women of the community, and they will be tagged and vaccinated. The animals will be redistributed to the entire community to the, all the women of Tangawashan. And after five years, approximately all the women will have benefited from the animals. Again, we want to thank Dining for Women for helping the women of Tangawashan. Thank you very much, Vina, and Dining for Women. Thank I'm, you. I'm open to any questions you might okay. have about a program. Uh, thank you, Ariane. Thank you so much for shining a light on the Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, the Dining for Women Board has recently recommitted to the Sustainable Development Goals. And thank you for sharing this project where you have brought such an interesting community to us that tell us about a matriarchal group of people who are at the forefront of dealing with climate change. And they must face a dilemma where they do not want to be climate change refugees. They have to make a go of their lives in the communities that they have decided to live in. So tell us more about what a typical family is like in these communities that you are working in. Thank you, Vina. Well, first of all, you, you brought up something very important. We, these women and populations cannot become climate refugees. There is nowhere for them to go. 
the entire subregion is is suff suffering from extreme poverty. So we help them adapt to the circumstances. So a typical family, first of all, again, just as a reminder, we're talking right now about a community of 2,100 people living in an area where there are about half a million people living under these circumstances. Um, each family member is probably between seven and nine people. Families typically have seven children about. Uh, and as I said, women are typically responsible for, the, for those children because the men leave and during the time that they leave, they don't provide any monetary means for the women to take care of their families. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, this is this is a lot of challenges for the women where they have to find economic sustenance and nutritional sustenance and all of that. Um, t tell us a little bit more about your connections to this community. I know that you, since your childhood, you have been visiting this region. Well, so I grew up in West Africa and partly in Niger. I, however, didn't, I had never gone to the specific region until I went, went to this region as a Fulbright scholar. Um, <clears throat> I, I actually went to Yale as an undergrad and majored in anthropology and then went to grad school in public health because I always wanted to go back and the people that help, help the people that help raise me. Mm -hmm. And when I went to this region, the first thing that caught my attention was that women uh, that I would meet would tell me, please help our children have water. They're dying of thirst. Uh, keeping in mind that Niger has one of the highest rates of child mortality, one out of four children, child dies before age five. In the Azawak, 50% of the children die before age five. It's very, it's extremely high. Um, and many of them die just due to lack of water. And so I went and I, I felt like I had to do something, but I was just one person. And so I went to different organizations. I went to governmental agencies and no one was interested. They're minority populations, they said, we can't help, they're too remote, it's too costly. Bringing water to them is just impossible. And so I decided to help, and I realized it wasn't impossible. And that's how things started in 2006. Um, and my, my first experience there was very touching. I went to the, in fact, Tanga Washan was the first community that I went to. And uh, I arrived in the evening, and I stayed with my host family, which had picture was the first picture we saw on my slideshow. Um, and Al Hassan, the man, overnight he traveled 20 kilometers to look for a goat to slaughter for me to have to eat in the morning. And um, when I found out about this, I was so touched. Little did they know that I was a vegetarian. I ate that meat, and I was extremely grateful. And that's just the kindness that I felt over and over again with these people that took care of me when I was there. And so, while Tanga Washan is not the only, only community that we helped today, it was the first community that we helped and we still help them today. Ariane, that is so wonderful. Thank you for sharing these really, really personal stories that you have with us. Uh, the Dining for Women family is extremely grateful for the wonderful work that you are doing. And we wish you the absolute very best in the success of this project. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dining for Women. We're very excited about this project. Great.